Hi Graham, I see you want to come in and talk rubbers again, which is uh, a bit doubtful, isn't it? A bit doubtful, yeah, but here we go. So we've got some new sort of, uh, these are what we call the cannibal shad. So I've put them as jig heads. So these are all pre-mounted rubber shads, which are really nice because you, you can see there's a little kickback hook there that holds the rubber in place so it doesn't slide when you're fishing with it. Um, so you won't get that bend on it, like you. No, you, yeah, when you kick it up and it yeah, stay flat, yeah, it's it won't really annoying when they do that. Because when they bend up and sit like this, when you're trying to use them, they're not quite right. Whereas that, it's a lovely show. This is what they call a paddle tail. Yeah. So it gives you loads of movement through the water. Um, these are what we call a dark water mix, and the dark water mix is basically brighter colours, so it pick up more in the sort of darker water. Hopefully, they see that and have a go. And they do a little mix. That's called their clear water range which is the darker ones, which I think is more for silhouetting because they're dark, they're silhouette bigger than the fish hopefully see it. Um, Both so the same weight, same hook this size? This is the same like weight, that. same hook size. There is so many variations in rubbish jigs, shad heads, that there's, there's just an untold amount. It's like a sweet shop of lures and it's insane. So I'll get you to have a pan round and you can show some later. Yeah, on I'll have a look at the whole, the whole range you got. Um, but these are probably like, we've got a canal locally, so we. I do concentrate on some of the smaller stuff that isn't going to be too heavy because it's fishing shallow water. Maybe It'll be three six, foot in the canal time. Three foot, it. six foot if you're lucky in a very deep spot, or there's a couple of areas where you've got some depth, but most of it is a three foot across. So you don't want to go in too deep. Too yeah. deep, and then you're snagging on the bottom, and as we all know, you buy your favourite lure and chuck it in the tree, or yeah. snag it on the bottom and you lose it. So yeah, sort of look at the depths of what you're fishing before you buy your lures and the weights and sizes, things like that. So we've got... There is, as I just said, there's loads of variations in this um, from smaller, heavier. So you sort of, we I think we've got five centimeter, three centimeter. Got so we get some tiny stuff about one centimeter, which is really small. Now you can probably see on the jig head. You'll generally, if you buy a pack of jig heads, I should have brought something to show. You. You'll have like a, maybe a size two hook with a seven and a half gram weighted head. Yep. So that'll give you that. Oh, that'll get myself that. Now we purposely, I'm shooting this from low, so we're not plugging the names if we can help it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're trying to get just a, a general range. There's a general, there's so many and vast, and every company out there does a range of lures of some sort. Some are better than others, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, of course you do. And they put, and you'll pay more money for it. So when you see like some of these rubber baits being really expensive, they're made of a slightly different material, like a latex. And what is it? They won't rip as easy as a rubber shad. Yes. Um, another top tip, if you're buying lots of different rubber baits to use and you know your lures, oh we've gone out. That's it, that's our motion sensor people. Over that we need to put another 5p in the machine. We've, we've got a ghost, we've got a ghost. So um, you'll find like you'll get better quality and you'll pay more money for ones which uh, basically don't tear. Bit tougher, yeah. Bit tougher. I mean, these are really good. You lose so, your tail, your stuff, don't you? That's you lose your tail, your stuff. I said that. Can you glue? Somebody said you can glue them with. Is it just super glue or a special glue? You can use a super glue, uh, but it's generally different. The super glue will generally melt. Oh really? You'll find some, some, and every rubber um, reacts different. So what I was going to say for my top tip for our light went out is if you're buying different brands in different rubber baits, keep them in different boxes. Because oh, yes, I, yes, I yes. have done it, I'm sure you've I've, done it. I know what you're going to say. I know what you're, we you did put, it recently. Put, put them all in your box and then yeah. you close it up and you put your bag away, you're all chuffed because you've organised it. You go fish, you tell it the bank, you open your box and think, well, what is all that? Yeah. And then <laughs> the, the two rubbers have reacted together with whatever they're made from <laughs> and then they, yeah. They have a they chemical dissolve. reaction and they dissolve and you just have a slimy less. And they stick to the everything and That's you it. peel them apart and the tail snap and off. They've had it, yeah. yeah. So. Top tip is keep them in separate boxes with the same brands as generally the same material they're using. So we've got and that one there is yeah, it? Yeah, so another perch, that's what they call. So this pattern, which you see really bright, like this one, is what you'll see in the tray called Fire Tiger. Tiger stripe, bright orange, bright green. Um, there's a million names for different colours and shapes. So I would just say get out in your shop and have, have a, a good look at your local yeah. shop and just have You're a green in there. And and really I, wouldn't jumps say, out. I get asked as a regular question all the time what is the best lure for catching pike today? And I say, I'll be totally honest, I don't know because there's so many. So I always have a range of 
brighter colours, darker colours, some smaller, some bigger, and have a chuck on the day. You could get a pipe that follows this ten times in, and you change to the bright green one, yeah, chuck he it out, it. and he, he nails it. And there's no fish no, swimming, no that, perch that like in the that. world that looks like that. And what to you, me, that's superb colours. That really does look like a perch. Yeah, really, really. Sick. But I think we all find with the predatory fishes sometimes they are just aggressive. They're territorial, and they will just have a have a stab at something because that's in their genetics to chase. For this size here, I would say these more for four perch. Would you say? I know yeah, Jack four Pike perch and stuff will eat and them. The pike and stuff will take them. I mean. I've got friends who have always amazed me by bringing the biggest spoon to go fishing with. Yeah. And chuck, we're all fishing these on the canal, and he's chucking a spoon that's this big, and he's catching fish quicker. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's just the reaction, aggression, the noise, thing. The, the more motion pulling for the water. But as we know, fishing is never the same every time we go. It's always different. Weather, water quality, leaves on the water. This leaves, time leaves, is yeah. really hard. So lure fishing at the moment for a lot of people in the canals is frustrating because. You'll chuck yeah. out and you get a ball of leaves. But yeah. you're not long now and the weather will change and then we'll hopefully them silverfish show up and then predators will be easy to catch. So we get and look. So we've got I've brought out a couple of others here with a range I've brought in. These um, are hard, you say. These right? are hard jointed lures, so you can hear they're tough. It's got a holographic print on it. So as my, many of you will know before even two, that is a picture of a chub. Um and basically when you pull it through the water, it just swims. You've got rattles in it as well, so really noisy, just to make as much commotion going through the water to encourage the pike just to chase it, really. Would you fish out as a, I know every, whatever, we just said that every fish is different, uh, as a constant retrieve or jerky retrieve to get the best uh, action so from those? A constant retrieve will give it a nice swimming motion. Yeah. But obviously if you give it a jerk and a chug, you can get that to react different shit. For me, do you want to act it to be an injured fish? Yeah. As most of us know, you'll pull on a lure, pull on a lure, pull on a lure, stop. Yes. And that's normally your bite. The hit bite. Yeah. yeah, the hit bite is when you slow down. So um, I think just play play with what you're doing. Change it. Do something different all the time. So sometimes I've been to places with really fast retrieving, the fish are on it and they're yeah. hitting it really well. Other times when it's really cold, a bit slower maybe because they're not moving quite as fast. So that's another, another print there of like a char. Are they made in America? I did look at the colours on that one down the shop while you were serving, I and uh, I did think, yeah, it looks like a sort of char. I wonder if these are made in America. So it's an Arctic char, so I don't think these ones are made in America. These are from, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what they might be, actually, because they're from a company called Hawkridge, which you won't see all of them. They're just random yeah. lure company that I picked up on, and I thought, I can't fancy them. I, as we all know, buying lures is like being in the sweet shop. We can't help it. We buy more than we need on all of them. So that's like your arctic char. Then I've got, with more joints in it, and actually rubber fins on this one to make it swim different. Some I've seen have got an interchangeable tail fin. Yes. Or something like that, I, I have guess, because so, they get bitten off or something. Um, no, so you get, well, one for that, you can place a tail. Two, what you generally have, you'd have something like that, a standard tail. Yeah. And then they have one with like a big curly tail that comes out and comes around like this. Oh, I've never so seen those. When you pull through the water, it, it moves and kicks around, just causes loads of commotion, so you can basically it causes more streaming bubbles, things like that. More like low more joints in that one. I'm zooming Lows in, I can see a lot more joints. You can see the movement in that as you pull it through the water. It will actually swim like this, which is really. Do if I can get alerted out by hand when it's in the water, it's going to be moving so much better. Uh, weighted? Do they have some form of weight in them, or they what so I call neutral density, or what? Neutral density, I'd say, because they're just the weight of the lure. So they chuck them out. They are slow sinking, and you just sink and draw, sink and draw. Um, but play with how fast your your retrieves are, um, and obviously your reels make a difference. If you've got a high speed retrieve reel, yeah. you won't be turning as much. No. If you've got a low speed one, you're going to have to work the reel a little bit harder. I don't personally like those. I've got one. It's a, an old Shimano. Like I said it's probably out of production now. It's a nightmare to fish low and slow because it's got such a high it's retrieve. High, yeah, half I don't a turn, personally it's like it. it. Yeah, I think everyone for their own. Because so. you can't get in the sort of rhythm of turning the reel handle at a nice speed. Nice speed this yeah. one is, I'm either too fast or too slow. I don't really like it, I'll you be can't honest. quite get into where you want to be. So that's a smaller version of a jointed chub. I've got uh, a local guy I've been using these on one of the smaller rivers. He's changed his barbed, uh, sorry, his treble hooks there, which are barbed on oh, those yeah, ones. Yeah. He's changed for single hooks. Yes. Uh, and it's what they call an inline hook. It'll have an eye, but the eye sits like a treble hook. So rather than being the hook side on, you'll see if I cut those two off, basically yeah. you can see the way that would then sit. 
as a single, I don't know if you can see it. Is there a name to that type of hook you're describing? It's, it's called an inline hook. Oh, well, there so you go. I will, I will pick some out and maybe you could show them on the camera in a second. For me, you know, just my fingers are there. That's 100% my size. Well, Grant knows this because I get my dead baits of that size, yeah. aren't they? That's the size because I'm making films. I don't necessarily want yeah, the biggest sort of pike. Lot. I just want to catch a pike. To me, this size, you can see the size of four inches. Yeah. That's, that's to me, it's a, it's a lovely little a good size little to start. Size. Again, it's just a copy of what I've got here in Larger, so another little Arctic jar joined in the middle, which is quite cool. And I've just had a life of buying lures myself, Graham, as you probably have yourself. Well, I've got too many, and now I end up using many. two in a day, three in a day, the yeah. ones I caught last time. And the time. same ones, exactly yeah. that. So again, another jointed pike on the smaller one, which I think is fantastic. The movement looks great on that, and I think if you were to pull that through the water, I think it'd look really, really lifelike. Like Something should pike. eat it. Yeah, I would say so. So... You got a, and they got a nice small, small, quite small, little slightly small trebles. Smaller trebles yeah, than those. So these seem like they're turned into like a beaked point, which is probably yeah. quite nice. It's like you're catching everything when you um, pick them up, as we were just discussing about having a pike spin round in in the net and catching your hooks. Oh, that in is there. an absolute nightmare. I've got to be honest. That it's is a nightmare. everyone's worst nightmare trying to get a, a treble hook out of the middle of your net. Now, just on the subject of that, just me off briefly. You can get rubber landing nets, is it? Are they supposed to be easy or are these bit not they necessary? They are, yeah, a lot better. So, um, I've not caught one up here, Graham, but I can show you this. This is a, a sea fishing drop net randomly, but what they do is they get the nets and they dip them in latex. So that now, have you feel that, Graham? It's got a latex rubber coating. Oh, yeah, coating. so it's almost it's like sticky, is it? Well? That's it. So it feels really strange, but they generally use this for lure nets and that. Is that because it's it's, it's not the, so much the holes are say wide? No, it's the material. It's the material doesn't unravel. Yes, it? because, because that's what can get you. That point is so fine. If you like, even my table's got a little canvas on it. That they do. Oh, there you go. I've got my finger. So they are so sharp. They just pick up threads, as you can see there. Yeah, that's it. That's where you get. And once they go through, if you if you got a crush barb or micro so barb, just hook that in the net. Yeah, it's gone in the net, but it hasn't got caught in those. Yeah, yeah. Which I wouldn't be doing that in a normal net. Oh my god, no. Not and then the pike years. twists. And the pike twists, so generally you there. can just unpick those. And that's it. For yeah. Oh, there you go. Whereas there you if go. that was a standard net, as you know, Grant, we would have just been fighting Absolutely that. Absolutely not. Holes and and I've done it, the scissors, yeah, yeah. And then tie it up with fishing line. So you'll generally find most brands selling nets will have a range of rubber latex nets yeah most tackle shops who will provide the lure stuff for you to look at um ask them for a rubber net they generally have fox do a good range of like the little triangular flip out nets like a trout style net if you like but they do yes. all the sizes bigger for the pipe fishing you've got boat style nets that are in latex as well there's, there's every variation you could want in a net that is rubber as well and so, how big do these lures go now these new sort of latex so, well, and solids and this still isn't the biggest lure but this is what they call a through line 3d chub you can see i've got the steel wire there it's got some weight to it so the wire goes right all the way through oh my god so you're gonna have to have a big old rod to beach cast rod that for me i would say this is more for fishing off a boat yes yeah than casting you could cast it but make a a, a big splash i would say yeah. right you can see how serious this is for a lure because of the style it is you've got that's a treble hook that's sitting in line. It's got the wire wrapped around and coming back through. Big treble. Big treble. <clears throat> a big treble, which we shall hook back in there. And then you can see there's a single hook there for a stinger on the back. It's got two pins, which looks rather strange. Let me zoom in on that so people can see. Let's get another hook, yep. Yeah, so it's rather strange, but all that is for is you push it into the soft body of the, the chub. It's pretty just to keep your hook in line, so you can I've have it, it all yeah. in line in one place, nice and straight. So I would say you'd probably look at using more of this sort of thing if you're fishing a big reservoir and you're going to be fishing for big pike, big pike it, yeah. and maybe you're trawling it behind the boat, possibly. Yeah. So again, that's a paddle tail. You say, what's that one? There you go. Twenty-seven and a half inches. Is that twenty-half seven centimeters? Sorry, that's a big. That's a big. It's a big, big paddle lure. tail, and they're going to feel some vibrations. And believe that. it or not, there's bigger lures than this out there for the pike fishing. And in in all reality of things, a ten pound pike wouldn't struggle to eat that if that was a real fish. If it was real fish, you'd turn it. Even it? if it was five pounds, you'd probably have a go at it. You know, as you will know, you you go out spinner fishing or with your lures, and you think, oh, I feel a little knock, 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 and yeah. it'd be a, a million little perch that are this size Banging. chasing something yeah. that big. So, but yeah, we'll show you the difference there from one end to the other 
of your soft baits, you've got your little perch or your big chub. So set your sights high and buy a big bait for a big fish. Is this a long wheelbase? Yeah, one oh, it is. I'm looking at it thinking, is it the way it's parked? Am I being stupid? But it is no, long no, wheelbase long for wheel base, 109, that's six a, cylinder. That's an 88 inch. That's a, that's, a uh, that's a 90. That's a 90. Of course. Yeah. And made for this job, or did you. That, that was always on it from new. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the, I think this garage here owned it. Yes. From new, and they had the mm. crane put on. And what sort of work did you have to do to it? I've completely resprayed it and rebuilt it. I didn't intend to do that much work on it. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine it turns into a labour of love. I think it's one yeah, of those things. About it, it ten years. So. Once you can't, once you start, you can't stop. No, but you want to upgrade. You get, you get hooked on it. So far, you think, well, I've gone this far. I might have, well, do the whole log now. And can you talk us through the back gantry? How that would? Yeah, well, this is the the winch handle, and I've got it tied off at the stop people sure. turning it. But it's got an automatic clutch in there. Yeah. So that and the brake. So it, when you wind it up, it's ratcheting, you can hear it ratchet, da, 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 and then you can let go of the handle and it stops. Yes, like my boat, yeah, no, it's on a ratchet, uh, yeah. But if you kick it back, yeah. it'll unwind. You don't have to release a ratchet, it's all automatic. Oh, I see, yes, yeah. It's, see this here, this bit here, Yes. that's in there and that turns. It's, as you as you start to winch it, that will turn a little bit and lock the clutch. Oh, I see. And then you wind it up, and then when you just stop, it stops. People never used to grease that. There's a grease nipple down there. So it should be greased then. Yeah, you'd, yeah, you'd hardly know, would you? No, there? no, it's there. Little grease nipple. And people don't grease it. And then when you let go of the handle, it spins undone. Oh no, nasty so, on the wrist. Yeah. Yeah, but you. So when you, whenever you travel, you lock this out. Yeah, push that yeah. in, turn it in, then you can wind, and then when you you pull it down, pull that out, and lock it. So Got it you. Can't yeah, come yeah. Down safety, you. safety. Yeah, yeah, that's the safety. And then when this is down, this A bar, that's called the A bar, goes in that on there, like that. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. You and, can see it. So this ring. Yeah, that's that the A bar. That goes into there. Another, <coughs> another name for it is anti sway bar. Because if you just had this hanging down with the chains, yeah. Oh, we see, swing yes, like yeah. that, you see. So you put that in there. What you do, you, you let this down, get on the front of the car, and push it back a bit. <coughs> yeah. Well, you put them chains under first on your suspension. Come up, hook it wherever you have to. Put an old cushion in there. Stop it scratching the car. Yeah. And then you put your back on it. Push it on that push it back a little bit and let that down into that hole yes and then let it come off and it would come there and you drop it in you know and, then that's and that being triangulated is a rigidity because yeah, the rigidity yeah, stop yeah, that it, twist yeah. it stops it swaying like that you couldn't tow it without that in so just explain how it works because this is an old piece of equipment so you're going to drop this down yeah you lower it down yep yeah. unhook your chains yes Hooked him round on an old car, it used to be the front axle. Yes. Or wishbone. So it comes car. off here and goes yeah, round. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take it off of there. Yeah. This is lowered right down to here. You get underneath the car, hook the chains back on, and then hook it on. Sometimes it'll go there, sometimes it'll be there if it's a long front on the car. Yeah. Then you wind it up, lift the car up off the ground, push it back, drop the, the that it down, and put the pin in, this pin. Yep. And then uh, just adjust it to suit what I you, you'd have a look at the back of the car and see if it was too too. But the ideal position was slightly lower than that line. Not too high then. Because what happens is if you've wound it up here, yeah. As you break, this A bar is now at that angle. So when you break, oh like yes, it, yeah, you can go forwards like that. Yeah. So if you've got it slightly lower or level. It, 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 it locks it. it almost, locks yeah, it. Yeah, it locks it there. Um, 
I had a good teacher when I started who yeah. knew all about them, you know. And he, yeah, but, uh, there's a method to the madness. Yeah, like I see, yeah. it could all go very, very badly wrong very quickly. Well, I, I used to have to stand in the back because I wasn't strong enough to work that by from the ground. But, uh, yeah. And it's in good nick, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I had all this sandblasted. It was really rusty. Can't be many of these left now, I should think. Is it like uh, this? The gypsies have got a lot where they do the scrap cars with them. Yeah. But they've, a lot of them have been altered and electric winches fitted down on the floor. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. With a cable. Do you have a winch at the front at all on these or not? They you wouldn't can have... do. I did have one what I used professionally, like when I did it for a living. But this one ain't got one on. And it's not worth putting one on. Good, thank you very much. I okay, appreciate it. I'll right. do, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You used to use one of these in anger. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got 107 for the straight down. Yeah. Is that the one you had here last year? Yeah, that's it, that's mine. Yeah. The 107. Yeah. 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 Well viewers, we're here in Mike's Wood, we're on a bushcraft expedition. We're going to be cooking one of the black bream I caught um, and I cleaned it, well it's the way to go. On the boat, cut the fins off, descale it, clean it all, it's job done. It's gutted, cleaned, wash it out, plastic bag in the freezer or tin foil, whatever fancies you, it takes your fancy for uh, storing it. So this is a nice black bream caught down on the South Devon coast in a small open boat. And we're up, uh, Mike's Woodland here and he's doing a totally different fire build which I was doing. Mine would be half a gallon of kerosene and some newspaper but apparently this is the way to go isn't it right? Yeah, so this is what I like to call a cooking fire. Yeah we so always, you... we're always bad normally on not <laughs> making it hot enough. So what you do is you, it's an upside down fire so normally you'd start your kindling really light and then you'd build it up with bigger wood, bigger wood, bigger wood, bigger wood until you, you know, you've got a bed of embers. Problem is, is you're always feeding wood in and you're always blowing on it. This is, this is an upside down fire. So you actually put your big logs on first and then you get smaller as you get to the top and you light it on the top. And the hot embers from the small kindling at the top go down into the wood below. They dry out the wood as they're doing it and they evaporate all the moisture. And then the heat stays in the fire. So you actually get a really hot fire and very very low maintenance you barely need to touch it in fact I did one the other night I did an overnighter similar size to this I lit it I didn't need to put any more wood on it or touch it for 45 minutes and I actually now light my wood stove at home doing this as well so I stack the big logs on the bottom two big logs then smaller ones like this then my kindling on top fire lighter on top light it and I don't need to put wood in my wood burner for over an hour. So it's sort of on the same principle as a Swedish fire torch, burns from the yeah, top it down? Burns itself. Yeah, it burns itself. So you just put thinner and thinner kindling, Jenga style, as you as you do it and, it, and it just burns itself. It's brilliant. And it's a, you need a good bed of embers when you're doing cooking, cooking with... Yeah. with uh, We're fighting the weather, folks, as well. Yeah, rain's coming. Rain is coming big time. We can go in the cabin, of course we can, we can stay dry in there, but not good for cooking fish. No question of that outdoors. We might take some wood back for both our log burners. I bought Mike's chainsaw up here, charger batteries, hopefully. Left them on all night anyway. And we got our cooking stuff here, so we have to see how this lights. So we lit that bad just so you know, half eleven. We won't need to touch that now for half an hour, forty minutes when you want to put the fish fish on. It just feels a bit weird. It feels odd, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a strange way of doing it. Strange. It's a strange way of doing it, but if you think about it, it's all that condensed heat. So the fire gets plenty of oxygen and air at the top. And obviously there's not much oxygen and air down here, but it's keeping all that heat in and fire needs heat to burn as well. So 
it's getting all the oxygen it needs from the top here and the air and then it's getting the heat from down below from the woods rather than the, the wet ground here that's sucking up that damp and that cold that's going to make your fire struggle all the heat stays at the top and burns down as the ashes from the wood above it drop into it well, it's, a game, it it's a game changer <laughs> honestly try this in your wood burner at home dad yeah a couple, oh. couple of big logs at the bottom not your giant logs that you yeah. put on when it's like really hot coals that sort of size logs on the bottom two or three depending on your wood burner then split that size down again and put that on top and then get slightly smaller until you get to your kindling here and then honestly that sort of height not the top to the top of your wood burner but that sort of height light it and that's your ash it. that's your that's ash. The, the wood, wood burner ash. yeah this is seasoned a year so old that's season. a year old under tarp old and dry yeah 100 year old ash that is from the from the tree the big yeah. tree that came down then we just leave it that's it I think it's cold, it's not once you start working. I've done a little bit of tidying up here, a little bit of housekeeping. And Mike's right, my mate's that fire over there, look. We haven't, I haven't gone to it, we just left it, and it's just hopefully gonna eat its way through that yeah, wood. Yeah, yeah, it starts to, I just put a kettle next to it to warm up, but we've got time before we put the kettle over it. And this is constructed beautifully, yeah. so I think if we get that really hot, it'll probably crack and fall down, <laughs> and, then, and then the maker will be approached I, with a guarantee. I'm, I'm amazed that the chimney's still going. Yeah, no, you can actually that. see that we built this at the front here, the, mm. the fire. If you put the fire under there, it yeah. sucks the smoke. And if you look, the flames are going towards the chimney there. Yeah, they're That's just good. leaning. They're just leaning that way. But I just didn't want to waste a really good chimney pot there. And you've made what a little pot hanger there? Just a little. Yeah, yeah. I just want I used these. I need some taller ones of these to get the spit up higher. But yeah, just handy for hanging things over. So if we do get the rain, rain come, I've got my giant fishing umbrella there, guys. We put it over the fire. I've done it before to try and save a fire. Unfortunately, the next beach trip I go on or course fishing trip, it smells like bonfire smoke. So I clean back here, a bit tidy. Oh, of course, all the leaves are going to come down. Don't get me wrong. They're all going to go gold. Another two weeks, I would say. Two to three weeks, they'll go gold. And being beach trees, they'll be lovely colour. So we'll get you guys up here and uh, have a look and show you what we've got in the colour when the full autumnal colours come. When you see it sort sometimes this isn't struggling but when you do see it struggling often when it's wet wood you need those coals to get down further into the fire all you do is some of the overhanging pieces of wood like this you open them up a bit and that lets some of the hot coals drop down and it also allows a lot more air into the fire that's a clean burn isn't it? There's no, yeah really no good smoke it's really good tiny and any bits that fall off like this just add them to the top each time rather than letting them burn around the bottom of the fire because they will continue while well, they're hot to burn a lot better. Yeah, and we got the grill nice. there for keeping stuff warm if we wanted. That's what we put it there for. Smoking. <laughs> yeah, kind of smoke smoke. toast. Come on. This is this is the first pieces of ash that I actually cut what two years ago now from that giant ash tree that came down. Um, it's been out here to season for a while. I kind of use this for camping wood for, for when I'm doing the camping and bushcraft stuff, not for my wood stove at home. But I do have over here, a bit eagerly piggledy, but I've got a lot more bigger ash which has been off the ground and this is ready to This is the same tree, isn't chop it? Chop up. This is all the same massive tree. So tons of firewood. We, we built that needs drying. We built the whole cabin from this tree. We built that from the tree, the log store there, the kitchen bit. Oh, just so much. It's been amazing, this tree. I remember when Ryan cut it down, the amount that came off the branches, yeah. folks, these are branches. That's a branch, They're yeah. branches, that's not the it tree. It was a massive, massive tree. You see back in there how big the root system was. And it, when it crashed, it came right down and cleared like yeah. 150 feet there. Yeah. So we'll cut one of these up. Probably something like that. That's a good size. So they're starting to dry. Yeah. And we can, it's not rotten yet, but it will start to now if I leave it any longer. Here comes the rain from the sounds of it. This is what happens when it's on the ground, guys. Look at all the the fungus and that grows on it. That's what happens when it's right on the ground to rot, and so it is best to get it cut up.
and that's the tree it came from that split apart and here comes the rain we've had to come back because the rain's coming and I bought the big giant green umbrella trying to Right. Is that okay? Sure your gear's gonna get wet. Yeah. All the firewood that's dry is now wet. Let's put this trolley up on it. Yeah. So we ducked into the cabin, it's pretty dark, but I installed this the other day, which is um, some lighting. It's not really a cabin to be honest, it's where we store all the tools and things like that, but firewood I store in here, axes, uh, the chainsaw, ladders all sorts of store in here but obviously when i'm coming in to try and get tools it's pitch it's pitch black there's no it's lighting black, yeah we so got I the just, oil, oil yeah i there. just i just light it with this little portable battery which i can i can lift out and take away um and it only that's these lights are only drawing 15 watts so it says it's got 14 and a half hours of battery running at the, these lights so i'm not in here for 14 and a half hours and what else do you run off of that dc uh there's a dc output of a um 12 volt 12 there. volt there there's also 12 volt, there's USB C, USB A, sorry, and a USB C. And yeah, and there's a wireless charging thing up here for phones if I need to. But what do you do? You, you, you can you can put, put your phone on there. Yeah, you, I had a different power setup in here last year, a much more powerful setup with solar and things like that. The problem was we're in the woods, so it wasn't getting much solar at all. So I had it all up here. I had a unit and batteries. Oh, that's right. But what yeah. was happening is the batteries were dying because there was not getting enough solar. Uh, where we're in the woods even with the, the flat roof and lots of panels on there it just wasn't working so I figured it's easier to just have a small battery like this that I can just take home and yeah. charge at home and then it will last me weeks out here at that, uh, even that a day, day. Yeah, day yeah even if I'm up for a day but that's 14 hours of I'm not in here for a day I only use it like now where we're ducking out the rain so um it's just handy for that and got the witch's stores, broom there as well yeah the bez bezin broom we can fly home on that yeah that might fit the wife <laughs> But yeah, this is a handy type of place to duck out the rain, really. It's yeah, dry. Well, hopefully. And it's lived up to some pretty strong storms, this thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about a tree falling on it, but no. it might be done. Yeah. We, well, I remember we left a big overhang. Are you panelled that in? I tried to panel it, yeah. yeah. Look, I panelled all here. All of this is all panelled. Oh, that was what's different, yeah. yeah. And then I've got some for the back, to panel in the back, just so we don't get birds and things nesting in it. But it's just much better with that lighting. Or hornet's nest, that's the one you don't want. Yeah. So we're just waiting for this to burn down and the rain to stop. Things with a fish not going to take long anyway, is it? Fish, what, 10, 15 minutes? I guess, yeah. With yeah. the coals, they'll be so hot. It won't take long at all. I feel I want to put the umbrella yeah. in the chimney. <laughs> I, <laughs> fear the, I fear the worst. Now you can see the flames going up the chimney at the back. Yeah. You can actually see them going up the chimney there. I put this bit, new bit of wood on to stop the rain getting the under bit wet. Yeah. So the top bit can get wet, that'll just evaporate, but it just protects the bottom of the fire from getting soaked and get, keeps the heat going in there. Is there heat coming out the top of that chimney? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's hot. Oh, that's really hot. I, I can't even keep my hand on there. I can't, yeah, that's a good point. I can't even keep my hand on it. You know, I'm seeing the flames go up there. Look, you can see the flames being sucked up the chimney. There you go. Man, if that works. Might be warm enough to just have a warm drink. Yeah. Or warm food up plates or something like that, you know. So I think you've been judging by how slow that one took to cut. I think you've, it needs a bit of a sharpen where you've used it, Doug. It's got this little shelf sharpening lever here. So you just run it. helps to get the worst of it off. <laughs> that definitely needs it's a better. new blade. It's better anyway, won't it? That's right. Yeah. 100% it needs it a new blade. Forward.
so the old chips are pretty well done we're just keeping those warm there we've got the mold wine on here and Mike says we cooked this fish absolutely on the co these coals they're plenty hot enough to cook it and that grill is that sort of fishy type grill is really good well people we're hoping that the uh, the rain holds off we've got the mold wine Mike's just gone off filming some uh, trees that he planted the fish is going well the mold wine's doing well it's all steaming there you can see the smells lovely chips are keeping warm and the fish there is, I believe, doing very nicely. I've, I've pulled it off and I've blown the embers a bit. You can see it's really heated up there. I've got some parsley sauce in there as well. And hoping that will warm up and uh, soften up a little bit. So it's all looking really good. And this is probably the first good cook up we've actually had, other than like a bacon sandwich, in this quality built, father built fireplace. We should call it Father's Fireplace. We're cooking in Father's fireplace. We just need about 10 minutes of no rain. Pretty good little campsite though. Good job I bought the umbrella because we've been sawing some logs up. That's Mike's dry stash. So we're taking that back because we both got log burners. So we're going to take a wheelbarrow back full. We're sure to get the cold weather sooner or later. And then uh, at least it'll be dry wood. This is, this is where all the mums of the world go. Look, the dinner's on the table. I've taken all this trouble to cook it. It's on the table and there's nobody there to eat it. I get it exactly. Where's he gone? Mind you, I could eat it all myself. I mean... Be a shame to waste that mulled wine, wouldn't it? Well, have no fear, it, it it won't be wasted. Just starting to bubble the old pasty sauce. So right, you bring it over. Well, it's good to me. It all looks good to me. I do like this little thing that stops it. Good, isn't it? Falling apart. Well, yeah, it does actually. Yeah. I'm gonna drop that round there. Wow, that's hot. Take a look at it. Perfect, dad. Oh, it's just breaking up, but yeah, that looks really good. And I say I've taken all the scales off it, probably better off with a knife and fork, to be honest. I know some people, oh, I know I can smell it. it. Smells lovely, that that does smell like fish, fish, doesn't it? Yeah, it is a fish, fish. Now, that is actually cooked, that's cooked really well, but it almost too much because I know yeah. uh, they always say don't dry, overcook it, it will it'll, it'll get drier. But that's our first time using that sort of fish grill, so... Well, that's the first time on that fire. True, on coals. So we're going to take some off. Check through bones, there's going to be some. There will be bones. I feel like there's... Quite a lot of meat on there. There is actually quite a lot of meat on those. All right, and then we've got the chips. I'll give you the big potatoes because you've been doing most of the watching. <laughs> yeah, we've been uh, chopping wood, sawing wood, doing bits and pieces. A bit of wood and management, really. That's what it boils down to. It's a very English spread that with a little checkered towel under it. I thought that. I did think it's all 1920s, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With um, the mild wine as well. This, this and one. And the beach and, we, and we've got and we've got the parsley sauce. A very very slight problem with it. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a metal might be. Do you want the glass? You're going to run it. It's bubbling. We just tip it on the side. And then you can have it on your potatoes or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Parsley sauce, saute potatoes. Oh, My goodness me. Fresh fish. It's bushcraft gone mad and fresh fish caught by our fair hands. Followed by, yes, you guessed it. The mold wine, guys, there, which is very warm. Look at this, sir. There, oh, there we are, sir. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, sir, if they could leave a Thank tip. Thank you, good chap. You leave a tip afterwards, it'd be very nice. <laughs> the staff don't get paid much, you know. <laughs> no, notice how I suddenly went into Mr. Manry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's zoom in a bit. Well, there, Dad. well, this is a job that takes me back a few years. 
peeling all the uh, hot chestnuts. They've cooled off now, but you can see they're a lot softer. And you just gotta split apart the husks to get to the nut inside. I have heard people boil them. I don't believe I've boiled them. I just always been taught by my grandfather to take the trouble to get out the best bits you can. You can see, look, you can see what he says about them being split there. If you put those cuts in them, they're just easier to sort of pop apart like this. And then you can get the nut part out. I'll just pile it all in there. A menial tar is a bit like shelling peas, as they say. I've done much of that as a child for grandparents. Many of you have, I imagine. So the fire's going down. Had a good time. Something a bit different. What a better one, that one. Look at that. You're always going to get that bit of husk in there somehow. You can't help that. So as you peel it, you lose a little bit of the nut. When they're uh, raw, you can scrape a lot of that husk off. But of course, they are going to be way harder to eat. Crunchy. And normally we used to eat them with salt. You know, I don't know whether the salt is to enhance the flavour of the nut or whether it's to take the taste away from there, the inside of the husk. Who knows? I'll wait till Mike comes back. We've got a good little feast of nuts there. Roasted chestnuts. Well, they're totally awesome. Dad's, Dad's fire. Dad's campfire. And it still hasn't fallen apart. I'm kind of surprised those two bits there didn't crack under that heat. And next time we'll try a bigger fire.